both people with migraine and their spouses said that migraine is really affecting their their life as a couple. It affects certainly planned activities, such as big activities like vacations or planning a party. It affects spontaneous activities, such as let's go to the movies tonight, right. or who's making dinner, or who's unloading the dishwasher. And it affects certainly intimacy. And I know this is a bit of an old joke, but of course, no one is feeling romantic and intimate when they have a migraine. As a result, all of these things trickle down and people told us they feel guilty, sad, angry, frustrated, and fed up. Nikki's life looked perfect. A home by the beach, a husband, two beautiful children, and a good job. What few could see were the invisible illnesses that frequently disabled her. Diagnosed with migraine at 15, her attacks kept escalating to the point that in her 30s, with 18 days of migraine each month, it threatened her well-being and livelihood. And then her husband left. Most people don't know what it's like to be so disabled by migraine that you can't think straight or care for yourself, let alone a child. For Nikki, surviving chronic migraine as a single mom became a daily challenge. The loss of her job, marriage, financial security, and the need to care for her children motivated her to seek better migraine treatments. What she's discovered in her personal journey may help you reconsider how you manage yours. Welcome to Me versus Migraine. In this series, we dive into compelling stories of real people battling this disease. In each episode, you will take away insightful nuggets to make living with migraine easier and less painful. I'm Paula Dumas, executive producer of the Migraine World Summit and president of the World Health Education Foundation. I'm Carl Cincinnato, founder of the Migraine World Summit, executive director of Migraine at Work and director of operations at Migraine and Headache Australia. And in just a minute, you'll meet health advocate Nikki Martin. But before we get started, I'd also like to thank the sponsor of this episode, Lundbeck, a company that's committed to researching, developing, and delivering transformative therapies for brain diseases. Nikki is part of Lundbeck's Migraine Victors Program and joins us today to share her story. Nikki, thank you so much for joining us today. You've had an especially rough migraine journey, especially battling it alone. That takes a lot of courage. Thanks. Um, it does, but you know, having family to help with that does help so much. I agree. I agree. So, Nikki, migraine attacks can differ for each of us. Can you describe what your typical migraine attack experience is like? My migraines have changed over time. Um, when I was younger, I have. I would have an aura every single time. It it told me that my migraine was coming. Um, lately, for the last few years, I haven't had those. Um, it's been decreasing over time, so now I just have none at all. Um, but I still have the bad sensitivity to sound. Uh, light bothers me. And I do get shaky and fatigued. I also get horrible brain fog that I think is one of the worst symptoms. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. What kind of brain fog incidents have you experienced with migraine? It's just constant. Um, I'll make little mistakes here and there. I'll be making my coffee and I'll accidentally put the coffee pot in the fridge instead of, uh, you know, back where it goes. And then the milk is still sitting on the counter. Or um, I mess up my words a lot. I'll mean something and I just can't think of the word. And it's gotten so bad that my children are even like, uh, do you mean this? Do you mean this? No, no, no. I, I couldn't think of the word library once. And for the life of me, I was trying to tell my kids we needed to go to the library, but the word wouldn't come out. And I just said, we need to go to the book bank. And they laughed. They knew what I meant. But, you know, it's, it's just constant little mistakes. Um, I did have one really scary incident. I've never had anything like it before, um, but I was driving in an area that I'm not familiar with. 
and I went to pull into a parking lot and all of a sudden there was honking behind me. I had no idea that there was another lane beside me and it was like I woke up out of a dream. It was just terrifying. I could have sworn my road was just a two lane road and all of a sudden it was a three lane road and I'd never come out of anything like that before or since, but it makes me hypervigilant when driving now. Yeah, I'll bet. I mean, brain fog is the worst, right? Carl, have you experienced that? Yeah, absolutely. Like difficulty finding words. Um, I think the medical terms aphasia, um, that's really common. And just a decline in cognitive function during the acute phase of a migraine attack is pretty severe, actually. Mm -hmm. Your uh, ex-husband must have been aware of your migraine attacks whilst you were dating. How did he first react? His mother uh, has uh, had a few chronic illnesses. So he was understanding and he knew, you know, it, it happens. Um, he actually could tell a change in my demeanor that I actually, I had never noticed, but he would tell me, are you feeling okay? Or do you have a migraine? And half an hour later it would hit. So uh, he noticed something that I have no idea how. <laughs> Well, that's great that he was there to at least help you understand some of your patterns. Um, and you talked about his mother's multiple illnesses, but you also live with RA and fibromyalgia in addition to migraine. Do you feel like your health was at all a factor in the breakup of your marriage? Definitely. Um, with everything combined, I... I had a lot of trouble doing housework, even just normal chores, taking care of the kids. I didn't have the energy to do dishes. Um, I would say, you know, this is good enough, but it wasn't. <laughs> um, I, my depression got horrible during that time and I was always in pain. And I know that was a huge cause of the separation. Yeah, I'm so sorry. That's, you know, like a double whammy, right? Yes. Nikki, how old were your kids when, like, whilst this was happening, like during this really difficult phase when you had depression? Uh, they were in fourth and fifth grade, so um, less than 10. And they didn't take it very well at first. They were, my daughter had some bad separation anxiety because of it, and we just, we stayed living together for a year just to get them through things. And then we separated. We're still, we're not divorced. We're still friends, but we just, we can't be together like that anymore. I just, you know, as a, as a young parent myself, and by young, I mean, my, my kids are young. I don't feel young, but, um, like it, I can, you know, I'm seeing sort of firsthand the sleep deprivation that goes along with young children when they get sick and they're, you know, daycare and, um, and at school and then with teething as well with really young sort of kids that can, that must've been playing a role as well. Like in terms of your ability to manage your, you know, your, your, your migraine condition, um, you know, sleep is a really common factor for a lot of people, whether it's a trigger or a part of the, part of the solution. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it, it was very difficult, um, especially I had one child who just couldn't sleep very well. And she was always in my bed sleeping with me. And then you have someone kicking and tossing and turning. My, I wasn't used to it because we had already, uh, we, my husband and I had never slept in the same bedroom. We're introverts. We need our own space. And I'm more comfortable alone because I can make it dark and super quiet and cold. Um, so having my child in the bed with me was another huge factor. I wasn't getting the sleep. And because of that, I was having more symptoms. Mm. It's a lot to juggle for any parent, right? Parenting is hard enough without that extra layer. And I know we talked about brain fog before. And when I would have brain fog during a migraine attack, I couldn't remember when I took took my last medication or uh, or what I had done or and I couldn't make good decisions. How do you feel like brain fog affected your parenting ability when you were caring for your kids all by yourself? It was and still is difficult at times. Um, 
I would lose track of time, not get them lunch on time or um, be 10 minutes late from the bus stop. And it wasn't often, but it always makes you feel like it's, you're a horrible parent. How can you do this? Leaving them at the bus stop for this long. Um, just every little mistake makes you feel worse and worse about yourself. And it's, it's difficult, <laughs> but you just do the best that you can. You know, people talk about the physical pain that migraine inflicts with the, you know, for a head pain with a lot of people, but also these disabling symptoms. And so physically it really takes a toll, but psychologically it's also, you know, waging this horrible battle or war against you with this guilt that you, that, you know, that you speak about because you can't be the parent or the worker or the person that you want to be because it's constantly holding you back. And then you have the shame and guilt as a result of not being able to do that. And that kind of feeds the the stress and, you know, the anxiety that can sort of, you know, roll into the next attack. And, you know, you can quickly find yourself in this really dark place as a result of having, you know, frequent attacks. It's, it's, it's horrible. Mm -hmm. It is. It, they feed into each other and it just, if you let it get so bad, it's this hole that you just can't get yourself out of. Um, because for me, my depression made my migraines worse. My migraines made my depression worse. So it was just, they were feeding off each other and making each other so worse. You feel, you feel not enough. You feel helpless and you can't do anything right. You can't do anything because you're always in pain or you can't think clearly enough. So it's just very important to get your mind in a set where you can accept things as they are, not have expectations for, I need to be perfect. I need to do this, you know, the right way. Just do what you can. And that's, that's all you can do. Did you seek professional help, Nikki, during that really difficult time? Yes. Um, I've been seeking professional help for years, even before that. Um, but I've been di misdiagnosed back and forth. Um, so it wasn't until I got my latest therapist, a uh, psychi psychiatrist, who told me, you know, it's not actually just depression. I'm also, uh, I have bipolar too. I, my manic episodes are so minor that I never noticed them. For me, it's just feeling normal. I can do this. You know, it's good enough that I can do this. Um, so once I got situated and I got in a place uh, medically so that I could uh, do the therapy. It, it just made all of the difference where things made sense and the therapy stuck. So it's, you have to have a good doctor who actually listens to you for anything. You know, I can tell that you've uh, been in the care of a therapist who's given you some very sage advice. Um, like that idea of letting go of the things that you can't control and um, embracing the idea that I am enough, right? Your kids are blessed to have you as a mom. Um, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to overperform. But those are really important mantras for all of us to consider whether or not we're dealing with uh, actual mental health challenges like you are facing or we're, whether we're simply dealing with the guilt of being a mom or dad with migraine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So migraine sent you to the emergency room a few times. What was that experience like? It was both horrible and amazing. Um, I only stayed, I've gone to the ER twice and only once have I stayed long enough to get treatment because you're sitting in a very loud, very bright room with a ton of other people who are not feeling good. And every cough and every sneeze is making you feel worse. Um, so the first time I just said, you know, this isn't worth it. I'm going to go home and I'm going to sleep. Yeah. So, um, but if you can stick it out, I was, I can't remember what I was given, but they called it the magic migraine cocktail. And my son was young at the time and he had to come with me. And I remember not even five minutes after I got the uh, IV, I looked at my son and I started laughing like, this is it. This, it's work. It's, it's gone. You know, it was just, it was magic. <laughs> Everyone wants some of that, right? Uh, 
who do you uh, tend to rely upon? You said you took your son with you this time, but when you have these attacks that are completely disabling, um, who's taking care of your kids and who's taking care of you? Um, after the separation, um, I moved in with my mother and we all, we got along really well. We're just a very tight knit unit. So everyone takes care of everyone. Um, if I have a migraine, my oldest will come. Did you take your medicine? And I'll, I didn't think about it. Okay. Um, my, my son, my younger, he has neck issues. So he'll be, mom, here's my massaging neck pillow. You need to use this. And, um, and then of course my mom will make sure I'm laying down and everything's cool and dark and they, the rest of the house is nice and quiet. They don't, don't disturb. So then, um, she'll make dinner that day. And, um, if there are any appointments to run, she'll go ahead and run them. And we just all work together. That's beautiful. I'm glad you have them. I'm very lucky. Yeah. Yeah. Nikki, were you seeing a doctor um, during those times when you were visiting the ER? I was, but he had, my doctor at the time was in his 80s and he was close to retiring. Um, So I couldn't always get in because he was either on vacation or out for personal reasons so the first time was while he was out and i couldn't get it in contact and the second time was after uh after he retired did you have a letter from him when you went to the er telling the staff like w- would that have been helpful if you had that do you think definitely because if you go in and say you have a migraine the doctors will kind of look at you like you're just asking for medication And um, it would have been an amazing help to actually have a letter or even, you know, if I thought to bring my prescription migraine pills, I thought, you know, maybe, maybe that would have helped show that I'm not just here. I, I don't even want the the big pain meds. I just want whatever you can give me that'll get rid of this. Yeah, there are people uh, listening to this at home right now who are literally grabbing their hair because they're remembering their last trip to the ER when they were, you know, accused of being a drug seeker. And it's not that way. But unless you have one of those letters from your doctor that kind of says, here's the protocol in the event of emergency, Nikki needs X, Y, and Z, and this is what she's taking, you know. It's really, really hard, uh, especially when you're only accompanied, you know, by a child and you're walking yourself in the door. So let's pivot for a second and talk about your work because um, uh, it, maybe you're like us, where chronic migraine has affected your ability to work. Tell us about that. Yes. Um, up until my late twenties, um, I was always working. I. Sometimes I actually worked two jobs because I like to be busy. Um, <clears throat> but when the migraines got worse and when I had children, um, I was in a job that I just I couldn't handle anymore. I was calling out because I needed the time off just to to get through the day with my migraines. Um, so I decided I'm not going to work anymore. Uh, I became a stay at home mother and. I had wanted to go back to work, but I was having so many migraines a day, it wasn't possible. So I tried to get on disability. Um, I actually had it denied twice. So I had three different doctors sending in paperwork saying this, you know, she, she qualifies, but it never went through. So it was frustrating. Um, but when I started on my new type of medication for migraines, um, things got more easy to, uh, they became more manageable. So I actually, after the separation, um, went back to school so that I could get a better job and doing an online degree program, let me work when I'm feeling fine. Every now and then I would have to cancel a meeting with a classmates or something like that, but nothing major. So I was able to get the degree and 
I just got accepted for a new job. I start in a couple weeks and I'm hoping that my stress, because that's a huge trigger. I'm hoping that the stress, the driving back and forth to work uh, with the lights, I'm just really, really hoping that everything stays nice and mild so that I can go to work and do my dream job. Well, congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. yeah fantastic. That That's such a, such a great story to hear. Going back to the time when you had chronic migraine and you had to leave your job, how did that affect your financial security? I was working um, at a job that I didn't really like and I'm sorry. <laughs> My husband at the time, his mother knew a financial advisor. So when they found out that I couldn't stay with the job anymore, she had me meet with, had us meet with the advisor. Um, and she said that with daycare and all of the other costs, it's actually more feasible for me to just become a stay at home mother. Um, because I hadn't finished my degree at the time, so I wasn't making as much as I knew I could. Um, and so it actually didn't affect us too hard because of the lack of childcare, the uh, lack of the need for childcare. Um, but afterwards, with the separation, it left me in a huge hole because now I didn't have uh, the experience after 10 years of a stay at home mother. You, There's nothing on your resume anymore. Um, so I did have to move in with my mom so that I could afford, you know, to take care of my children and everything. Yeah, that re-entry process back into the job market. You think about um, the the 10 years of lost wages, although not lost if you're focusing on your kids, right? And um, doing the most important job there is, is being a mom. Uh, but it does affect your long-term financial security, how much you're able to work when you're young. Uh, we see that in the statistics, but when you put a face on on the statistics and you say, this is what happened to me, it gets real for people. And I think that's one of the real costs associated uh, with chronic migraine that people don't think about is, is how much it's affecting their long-term financial security. So was there a tipping point that finally motivated you to seek better care? At the time, I thought I was doing everything that I could. Um, you know, I, I had a neurologist, I had all of the specialists and the doctors that I thought, you know, I thought I was getting the best care that I could. And a friend actually came up to me because she knew how often I had migraines. Um, she said, Hey, I know of a migraine research study that's in the area. Go ahead and call them. <laughs> so um, it was a, a new class at the time. It was the Gapants. And um, so I'm like, okay, something's new. I'll try it. And that's actually what got me to realize that there were better medications for me, even if they weren't the new ones that I had been um, using in the research trial. There were, a, there, it was a whole new world of migraine medication that I had never even tried before. It's interesting you mentioned that you did it as part of a clinical trial. What, what I think a lot of people don't necessarily realize is that you get amazing care when you're taking part in a trial because there's a lot of controls in place. They're monitoring almost everything that could affect your migraine condition. And so you're getting actually, in many cases, you know, better care than you might get outside of a clinical trial. And it sounds like that, is, that was a really positive experience for you. Yeah, I I loved it. And I try to tell everyone that I know if if there's a research trial for something that you're struggling with, there's no harm. You know, you're helping um, you're helping research with a disease that you already you know you're struggling with, and there's a good chance that you can find out about new classes or just new different uh, new types of treatments that can help you. Because, like you said, they the care was just astounding. And they had told me that even if this doesn't work for me, 
I see that you were on this and this and this. Ask your doctor about this afterwards. You know, so it was it was amazing. I loved it. Yeah, that's great. And I think you know when you you know, would people talk to me about clinical trials, I, I I tell them that as well that you know it's an opportunity to get great care. But it's also like important that if you do have you know side effects for people watching, if you've got significant side effects, which can occur, um, and hopefully you know, most of the time they're not serious, but um, but to you know speak to the people and you know you may you may or may not sort of need to discontinue the the trial, but um, but there's certainly opportunity and there's lots of clinical trials going on at the moment, so that's really encouraging. And you can also be in the placebo arm and not get. The therapy, but it's fascinating to me how even the people in the placebo arm can sometimes get a positive outcome or response to because the brain is the most powerful drug of all, right? If we can only channel that. Um, and they're not all drugs. Some of them are devices. Some of them are um, are uh, biobehavioral therapies. There are supplements. There's all different kinds of things that are tested through the clinical trial system. So. So, uh, were you, had you tried any preventive therapy uh, before this clinical trial that you did? Yes, um, I had tried uh, quite a few, and a lot of them had horrible side effects. Um, one caused even worse brain fog, which I just could not handle at all. Um, most of them would cause a little bit of tiredness, but that was livable for for the what you gain it was worth it for me um i had tried a few different abortives too and all of those would make me pass out i would just take it and go to sleep i'm I'm gone for four hours that was one of the main reasons why i couldn't work for so long because the medication works but i if i stay awake through it it's just impossible to to be human at the time that's very interesting i I, um experienced that as well i still haven't found um a fantastic treatment that will get me back to function within two hours unless i can sleep um and sleep sleep can get me back to function maybe not sort of perfect when i wake up but if i can get a couple of hours of sleep regardless of what time of the day it is um i can sort of see through the worst of an acute attack most of the time yeah, and it's fascinating how we all uh, can respond to different therapies in different ways. Because I've been kind of like a hyper responder to different therapies. I, you know, I try them; they work for me for the most part. Aside from some of the um, the side effects that we've all experienced, and don't want to do that again. So you mentioned that um, you've got a new treatment plan, and you're going back to work. You finished school. How is this affecting your ability to parent, to work, to concentrate? Well, the new treatment plan, um, I'm actually, I'm still on a couple different medications, but if it works, it works. I'm happy with it. Um, I still have quite a few over between 10 and 15 migraine days, but they're so mild. I, I have a migraine right now, but you know, what can you do? Um, it's manageable. Um, I will have some horrible ones here and there, but for the most part, I've gotten used to them. So I only have to have my fully disabling days every now and then it's rare. That's fantastic. So I do constantly live with some kind of symptom. Um, but I've just gotten to the point I'm so used to it, like, you know. And it sounds like the treatment plan that you're on is actually helping you with a, a lot of those acute symptoms. Like it's taking the edge off the attacks. Definitely. It, like, it's taken the edge off. That's exactly what it's done. Um, where before everything would be at a 20, where now it's it's there. It's maybe a two. It's not so bad. It's livable. But the constant, just the fact that they're always there does give you a lot of fatigue and more stress just because it's so constant. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can can relate to that for sure. So uh, now you've joined uh, the Legion of Health Advocates, um, something that Carl and I have been doing now for the past decade. Are you noticing any therapeutic benefits 
in your health journey as you begin to share your story? Yes, um, quite a few. It it feels good to feel heard. Um, that's one of the biggest things. Um, but also, as you talk with people, you hear tips and tricks or more stories so that, oh, I'm not alone. There are lots of people who go through this, um, where a lot of the time, if you're not talking with other migraineurs, they'd be like, well, it's a headache. And what's so bad about that? And you're like, no, it's not just a headache. <laughs> um, so it does help just to feel like you're part of a community and you're not alone. And to get those, uh, those stories from others, it's just amazing. How would you encourage someone who's struggling with migraine and parenting? <sighs> Take some time for yourself. Um, I know how hard it can be because with two little ones or more, or even with just one, um, it's you're a parent. You constantly have to parent. Um, but you can take some time out, maybe if they're after they're asleep or something, find something that you actually love. Um, for me, it's it's a cup of my favorite tea. I have to buy it online because I can't find it nearby. Um, but, you know, just sit there with that amazing thing that you love or do that amazing thing that you love. And you have to have me time. I think that's such a it, it's such a good piece of advice because it, it's it's kind of a novel idea that you would take one thing every day you know to do for yourself when you've got a young family um and just whether it's a cup of tea or you know a, a quick sort of half an hour show or a little bit of time with your favorite book like just curling up on the couch um we're not very you know you know we treat strangers often more politely and nicely that we would treat ourselves that like we're not often kind to ourselves when you know we're obviously not 100 percent. we're not well so i think that's some great advice there yeah it's like refilling your cup so you have some to share with someone else not necessarily with tea but but literally with with energy and peace um that you can pass on to your children if you're if you're emptied out and you haven't taken care of yourself you have nothing to give to them yeah, I mean, on the when you're on a plane, right, and the oxygen masks drop, they always tell you to put your oxygen mask on first, and then you know that of your child. There's no point you putting your oxygen mask on the child, and then you passing out before you kind of you know you get to yourself. And I think that's true for, for for life, right? If we can treat ourselves kindly, take a bit of time, it just makes us all the better when we go back to our family and kids and our responsibilities. How would you encourage someone who's struggling with migraine at work or the impact that migraine has on finances? Um, I think you have to realize that you can only do so much and you have to set realistic expectations. Um, don't compare yourself to your coworkers or to family or friends. Do what you know you can do and feel good about what you know you can do because everyone's different, you know? Um, so you have to focus on yourself and just realize that it's okay if you can't do everything because you're just doing the best that you can and that's the most you can do. So Nikki, you mentioned earlier that you like to stay busy. How have you recalibrated um, that natural disposition of yours because of your health? Um, I've had to realize that sometimes I just can't do everything that I want to do. Um, so staying busy has changed for me. Um, it's just doing what I can at the time and taking care of my family is something that makes me feel productive. I have to feel productive or I don't feel good about myself. I, I often feel like a burden. So I have to be doing something that will make me feel like I'm helping someone else. Um, so cooking is something that I love to do because you're, you know, feeding the family, um, just making sure that I keep the house clean or things like that. Um, I just have to do something to feel useful and it can be something small, you know, making a little piece of toast for my kid because he loves it, you know, so 
And even if the toast is burnt, it's okay because we're striving for progress, not perfection, right? And he loves burnt toast, which is disgusting, but perfect. (laughs) Nikki, is there um, any advice that you'd like to leave uh, for young women in the audience that you would share as a result of your experience? I used to think that this is as good as it gets. You know, Um, I would just always strive for doing something that can make it better. Maybe it's seeing a doctor, maybe it's seeing a new doctor if you already have one. Um, It could be a little bit of therapy or meditation, but always do something at least small to make life a little better for yourself. Um, And keep it baby steps. You're not going to see any changes overnight. Well said. Well said. It is It is a lifelong journey that we're all on together. So uh, together we'll be stronger. Well, thank you, Nikki. We really appreciate you sharing your story and giving us your insights. And I know a lot of people have been inspired um, by what they've learned from you today. I was kind of reading the comments as they came through. There's some fantastic suggestions um, and tips that people had. And it was really interesting to see some of the results in the polls as well. Yes, great polls uh, on shame, guilt, and how we feel about things. And I love the tips on self-care. Um, we, we've got a couple of minutes. We're going to go and take a look at some of the um, expert clips that we have, which address some of the elements that were within Nikki's story. And then we're going to talk after that uh, about your questions and get to those before our time is wrapped up. Yeah, I mean, Nikki, Nikki's certainly been through a lot, living with chronic migraine, trying to hold it together, uh, you know, her marriage and raise children. And you know, as a new dad myself, I just, I can't imagine doing it myself alone. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I had a serious maternal PTSD just listening to her describe life as a single parent, and she's really fortunate to have help from her parents, which not everybody can do. So... Let's listen to Dr. Dawn Buse. This is an expert that we've had on the Migrant World Summit. She's from the Albert Einstein School of Medicine. She's one of the preeminent researchers on the impact of migraine that it has upon our lives and our relationships. Both people with migraine and their spouses said that migraine is really affecting their their life as a couple. It affects certainly planned activities, such as big activities like vacations or planning a party. It affects spontaneous activities, such as let's go to the movies tonight, or who's making dinner, or who's unloading the dishwasher. And it affects certainly intimacy. And I know this is a bit of an old joke, but of course, no one is feeling romantic and intimate when they have a migraine. As a result, all of these things trickle down and people told us they feel guilty, sad, angry frustrated, and fed up. That is such an emotional tornado every time a migraine attack comes in and interrupts the rhythms of our everyday lives. You know, it's kind of like one of those big storm systems and leaves this terrible aftermath in its path. Nikki talked about how much her husband took over the childcare responsibilities and a lot of resentment can build up often when that happens. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I can't even tell you how many times my husband had to drop his plans take uh, and to take the kids somewhere or throw a frozen pizza in the oven. Uh, we had a tag team system, you know, but it was the worst. And when you have to go to the ER, uh, sometimes with little kids in tow, just like Nikki talked about. Yeah, that's another thing that she did mention. And when treatments fail, and we have to go to the emergency care room. Uh, Dr. Shapiro is, is someone who spoke about it from the University of Vermont. He discusses this in one of his um, uh, interviews that we have done in the past with him. So let's take a look. In the current situation where uh, opioid seeking uh, is something which uh, is uh, highlighted in emergency departments, anyone who comes in with a, uh, a complaint that includes pain uh, will be potentially uh, a suspect that they're actually there to seek uh, opioids. And if their behavior doesn't meet expectations, then uh, there leads uh, to uh, a potentially harmed relationship between health care and the person who's receiving the care. Uh, this is a difficult, difficult problem to solve because it requires uh, really an education about what migraine is and what it isn't within the healthcare profession. Even among doctors, 
there's this identification that migraine is headache. When migraine is not headache, headache is just one of many symptoms that occur in the setting of migraine. And there's just not enough education yet uh, in primary care or emergency medicine to appreciate that migraine isn't going to look like what people assume it will look like. The ER can be kind of a disaster. It's almost like one of the worst places to go with the bright lights, the smells, the other sick people around us. And people with migraine are one of the last people to be seeing. So we often have to wait a long time. True. And we're often given this migraine cocktail that knocks us out of commission. We're going to talk about that during the Q&A. And, you know, despite the progress that we've made in terms of research and new treatments, we still have a gap in treatment and and the ER is one place where we feel it. So uh, I think we need to keep people out of the ER by ensuring that they have a better treatment plan with their doctor. 100% agree. And um, this was something that Amal Starling spoke about. She's from the Mayo Clinic. She talked about some practical tips on how to improve your care and speak to your doctor. Um, so let's have a quick look at her interview. Despite substantial advancements in migraine treatment, many people with migraine are still not satisfied with their care and they're struggling to achieve their health goals. It also identified several opportunities that can be fulfilled through a more effective collaboration with your doctor. First, Doctors need to have an accurate understanding of your mental health, your overall well-being. That can be done by having a better understanding of your needs, your goals, and your specific questions about migraine. The survey also demonstrated the importance of effectiveness of migraine interventions. A goal that you and your doctor share is to reduce the impact and burden of migraine, which means to have fewer attacks but also to have effective treatment when the attacks occur. So two areas to focus on within this goal are to find effective ways to treat individual attacks and then also to proactively prevent disease worsening. And this is through interventions that you can select together through shared decision making. Now, these could be prescribed medications or options such as biobehavioral techniques, including evidence-based cognitive behavioral therapy. Also, remember that migraine treatments are not restricted to daily oral medications. Our toolbox has expanded to now include monthly or quarterly treatments as well as non-invasive devices. We now have more options than ever before to treat migraine. Yeah, that should give us all uh, hope that we've got more options than ever before. So I'd love to uh, pause it there and open it up to everybody who's been with us live and get your questions and your comments about Nikki's story and these three expert clips that we've just listened to. Absolutely. So to put your questions in, you can do so using the Q&A function um, uh, that's at the bottom on the bottom menu for most of us. Um, or you can just put it in the chat and we'd be happy to, um, you know, to answer that. Right. So uh, we talked about the ER and this uh, magic migraine cocktail that uh, Nikki discussed. And Jennifer asked the question, what's in a magic migraine cocktail? Well, that really depends, Jennifer, where you're going to, uh, because it varies by ER. Uh, I've heard physicians talk about Toradol, magnesium, sometimes opioids. Many of these really knock knock you out. Um, They are rarely migraine specific medicines, however. Um, They may also give you an anti-emetic, so you don't throw up a lot uh, from the medication, but um, hopefully they gave that to you first because many of us come in throwing up. One of the things I've learned about about the ER is uh, that migraine patients overuse or one of the biggest users of the emergency room. And yet we have this issue where ER doctors um, are not specifically trained in headache medicine or migraine medicine. Yeah, I remember Dr. Lipton, um, he had some great advice about, um, you know, the ER. And he often, he said that he often would see people visiting the ER for their first or their worst. So if you're having your worst migraine attack, um, maybe that makes sense to visit the the ER, particularly if there's new and different symptoms. Um, And at the same time, if, if it's your first and it's, you know, it's your first as an adult, it can be really scary. But he sort of suggested that you kind of want to avoid the ER for the reasons that have already been mentioned. 
and that doctors can put in place a, um, a rescue therapy. So you have your acute treatment that Dr. Starling just spoke about, but you can also have something if that acute treatment doesn't work, that's still designed to help abort the migraine. Um, and if, and so if you're, if you're not getting success there, then you can have a kind of a fallback option. So it's not just, you know, a trip to the ER, which is, you know, expensive, inconvenient, and obviously, you know, not the best place for someone migraine to be. Right. So Isabel asked a question, was it uh, difficult to find a therapist for mental health that was knowledgeable about migraine and the comorbidities that go along with them? And I think finding a great mental health professional is tricky anyway. There are so many things that we're looking for uh, from that person, from schedule and location and training and empathy and chemistry uh, with them. They're, how knowledgeable they are about migraine and comorbidities might not be the most important thing that matters to you, right? But I would say that uh, if you ask about some of the evidence-based therapies for migraine, like cognitive behavioral therapy that Dr. Starling talked about, uh, I think you will, uh, relaxation therapy, for example, uh, sometimes you can ask about biofeedback. Those are signals that that therapist has more experience and any that are attached to some of the inpatient headache clinics or even outpatient headache clinics are also um, really knowledgeable about migraine. So I hope that helps you find somebody great. There's a, a couple of questions here about um, your know, jobs and um, degrees and you know, what have you found? You know, Jennifer had a question about um, what have you found to have enough flexibility for migraine? Do you want to take a first stab at that? Oh, yes. Um, this has been a, a, a challenge and a pain point for me, which is why um, it's a key area of advocacy for me. Uh, first of all, I think that um, high demand indispensable jobs are ones that we're going to naturally provide you with more flexibility because you can't be easily replaced. And if you are really good at something, uh, and really passionate about it, or just really good at it. Um, it's harder to not promote you, to set you aside, to you know anything like that. But in terms of managing it, I spent the first 22 years of my career in a high pressure role, and that was at least 10 years too long. Um, I should have moved to a more flexible job, or at least sought out a um, a, a boss that would be empathetic. So in this current job market, you can actually interview your bosses and ask them about uh, when they might have given um, some of their employees more flexibility uh, or, or under what circumstances they you know, found it difficult to handle it when somebody called in sick. That way you're not really telling them that you have, you have migraines. So it's about finding a good, a good boss, finding a flexible job, often one that, that pays, uh, that, that compensates you based on um, results that you deliver, like writing an article or making a sale, for example, as opposed to hours clocked in. That those are the ones that are the hardest for people with migraine to do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's a really tough question. Um, you know, if you're in a new job or you're you're entering into a new role, at what point you choose to disclose, if at all, um, that you have migraine. Um, sometimes it's it's not relevant at all, and and if you're able to manage, um, then that's great. But if you need some accommodations, then it's really hard to get those accommodations without telling your employer. And I've heard I've heard stories of things going both ways. I've heard a great example of someone who would disclose that they have migraine, they've got these skills, they can do the job, but they, they do need sort of occasional accommodations and they need some flexibility with the time. Um, and they're not going to be necessarily, you know, sitting on their desk, sitting at their desk nine to five. And it's worked out really well. They've been a great employer. They've been understanding from the outset. And I've also heard, um, you know, it, things go the other way where it hasn't been, um, it hasn't been a great um, outcome and, and the support hasn't been there. And, um, you know, it's even been, you know, they've even been trying to be pushed out. So it really, I think, comes down to an individual decision, um, an assessment of, you know, the, the people that you work with. You can have organizations with an amazing culture, but if, you're, if your line manager doesn't support you, then that's really challenging. And in the reverse, you can have company that maybe isn't known for being super accommodating, but if you've got a great manager, that can make all the difference. So it really just depends and and having um you know and having kind of an informed idea of what you want to do in a plan in advance can really help. So Ruth asked 
a really interesting question. And I might ask you to elaborate on this a little bit, Ruth, to make sure that we're answering it the way that is helpful to you. Um, I always feel very sick, Ruth says, after the migraine subsides. Um, is that common for most people? And I think that really is a question. Uh, first of all, you, you're aware that there are four phases typically to a migraine attack. The 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 uh, prodrome, the kinds of things that you, early warning signals that you might feel that an attack is coming on, the um, the the, the um, aura can be part of that too, and then the headache phase or the pain phase, and then the, uh, what they call the uh, postdrome or the hangover phase. And if you're talking about the postdrome, the hangover phase, most people will say it's very difficult to get back to their regular activities even after the pain is gone. So in that sense, you're not alone. Sometimes uh, people will say that the uh, the most painful part of the attack, once, let's say they take medication and that part subsides, they notice the other symptoms like light sensitivity or neck pain or nausea that maybe the uh, that the medication didn't help or the treatment didn't help um, and uh, it, it took away the primary pain. So maybe that's what you're referring to, either the hangover or those uh, remnant sim- s- symptoms. Uh, fatigue is another big one. Carl, what would you say? Well, nausea and vomiting is so common that it's actually used as part of the diagnosis for migraine. So um, that you know that being part of the migraine attack is very common, and I remember one of the experts saying that there's no rules when it comes to migraine. Like these these phases of migraines are general sort of structures and general phases, but they don't necessarily come in that exact order every time. Um, so I would say it's probably some variation of that. Yeah, Ruth added it's it's a cycle. Before she gets over the post from a fa- phase, another migraine starts. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Yeah. And then that's where I think um, prevention needs to play a really important role to try and increase the, you know, the, the, the increase your threshold, and increase the difficulty of another migraine occurring. And also, also, if a migraine attack is rebounding right after you're coming out of the previous one, well, then that's probably speaking to the need to um, look at the acute treatments and look at something that helps see the migraine off as opposed to you know, it rebounding. But, um, but that's probably something you want to speak to your doctor about. Like if, if there is a chance of rebound or medication overuse um, uh, headache in that, in that scenario, you definitely want to speak to the doctor. And the other thing about, you know, whenever we mention medication overuse, it's important to, to, um, to say that, that you know, medication overuse is not our fault. We're taking the medication when we have migraine. And if our doctor hasn't told us how to do that properly, well, that's, that's something that needs, that's a conversation that needs to happen. So it's really worth going back to, to speak to them. Yeah, I was absolutely medication overuse 25 out of 30 days a month and with a with a pattern much like Ruth's. And uh and I was taking exactly what the doctor told me, exactly the way the doctor told me to do it. And so, you know, it's it's not your fault. Yeah. So Roberta's asked a question here. Um, I usually get all my migraines when I sleep and it wakes me up either in the middle of the night or I wake up in the morning with migraine. Carl? Yeah, and, and just before I jump into this answer, I think it's important to just um, remind people that Paul and I have spoken to a lot of experts ourselves, but we're not doctors. And so any information that we're sharing here is just you know what we've heard from others. And it's always important to speak to your doctor if you're thinking about, um, if you have questions or if you're thinking about changing your treatment or plan. Um, so Roberta, when you wake up um, at night, um, usually what happens is you don't have time. You don't have the warning that your migraine is coming. And so you don't, um, you're taking um, you know, an acute treatment that takes time to build up when you've already got, you know, a, a, an eight or a nine or a 10 out of 10 migraine, like in full swing, um, isn't going to be as effective as if you can take something that directly acts like very quickly. So um, things like an injectable acute treatment or um, an inhaler, um, particularly if you've got nausea and you take an oral tablet in the middle of the night, it's going to get stuck in the gut in terms of absorption because you'll have gastroparesis most likely. So those other routes of administration are going to be um, really important. There's even suppositories that that are an option as well um, that can sort of work and help. Um, uh, but that's a, that you know that is a tricky one, and it's an um, it is one of the signs of rebound headache. So 
you know, we're not taking migraine uh, medications when we're sleeping. And if our body's used to being on medications all the time, it can sort of have that rebound effect. So again, another another sort of good example of you know, why it's worth going back to the doctor to have a chat. And there's an excellent talk on that topic uh, with um, Dr. Andrew Charles called uh, Morning Migraine. If you go into the Migraine World Summit library, the bottom, the interview library, and you type in morning migraine, you can go straight to it. And uh, and he goes in 30 minutes in depth on that, uh, on that whole pattern. Uh, he will also mention something called hypnoketic, which you might look up and see if that is consistent with your symptoms and bring that up with your physician and see if uh, you indeed are getting a migraine attack and not a hypnoketic at three o'clock in the morning. Yeah. So, so it's like- I hope it. Yeah, there's like a dozen reasons why you could be waking up. We're kind of yeah. kind of trying to offer the big ones, but there's lots. Like there could be, you know, there could be all sorts of things going on. Yeah, thank you, Kelly. You just put that in the chat. That's great. Um, the Patterson family had a question uh, about how hard it is to treat someone with both migraine and mental health, um, a, a mental health diagnosis, without being able to mix those medications. You know, I think uh, this is a great uh, a great case for going to a headache specialist because when you are dealing with comorbidities and um, and drug drug versus drug um, interactions, um, they deal with this all the time. You know, the the percentage of people who have migraine and uh, depression or anxiety is in the fifty to eighty percent range. So this is not uncommon. And if you get to a specialist, I promise you they have dealt with this over and over again. Um, you'll also see some talks on um, migraine and mental health within the Migraine World Summit, and you can go in depth to get more answers about that. Carl, what would you say to this one? Professor Dawn Buse has actually spoken about this topic quite a bit. Um, the first thing to know is that there are treatments that deal with both. So you can take one treatment that actually helps with the mental health aspect and migraine um, and helps prevent um, migraine attacks. Um, so that's something um, good to know. There's a whole class of treatments that, that help in that space. The other thing to know is that often living with chronic pain is depressing, right? Chronic pain is, mis is, is miserable, right? Let's call a spade a spade here, right? Like it's not pleasant. So feeling... And like, and if you've been trying for years to to get out of that, if you've been trying different treatments, you've been going to doctors, you've been seeing different experts, you've done kind of the, the you've run the gamut, like all of us, you know, have at, at some point, then that can be kind of, you know, that can kind of beat you down. That can get you kind of down and feeling a little bit hopeless or, or um, depressed. And if you have migraine attacks that are occurring at the worst possible time, like weddings and birthdays and conferences and meetings and, and important sort of dates, well, that can cause anxiety. So it's really no surprise that, mental health is is comorbid is is more common in people that have migraine than in the general population so i think firstly not feeling any shame or guilt about that it's actually a normal a normal human response to a really difficult situation but also knowing that as you're able to improve that anxiety and depression migraine can improve as well if you improve any one of those three aspects the others can uh, tend to improve which is really a good sign for hope too that's right. I recall uh, some of the experts we talked to about this uh, saying, treat migraine first. And if migraine gets better, then the mental health conditions will also get better. But if you asked a mental health professional, they might say, treat the mental health first. Who knows? <laughs> but get, get care for sure. This has been such a great conversation. It was so nice to meet and interview Nikki. Um, she had such a great story and um, I think a powerful one that had a lot of lessons for everyone here. Um, and, um, in particular, I want to call out some people that, um, you know, who are, who are active in the chat that shared some insights and some knowledge that was just so helpful and fantastic. So thank you. Yeah. And the self-care tips that, uh, we saw coming out in chat, things like, um, prayer and meditation and forest baths and actual baths and, uh, baking and cooking, um, all good stuff. Uh, definitely take that time for yourself. Uh, it is not selfish. It is maybe one of the best gifts that you can give to um, your the people you live with and that you care about. And we would encourage you to do those just as we remind each other to do them all the time. Yeah, and I, I'd even sort of call out what what Tessie had said, which was um, you know accepting things as they are. That that was quite a challenge for her over time, but she's come to be to have much more peace about it. And she's learned to be more gentle and kind to herself and that she's been able to introduce these concepts to her family and to hear them using that language on their rough days. And so her spouse and her 
have gotten really good at making what she calls game day decisions and adjusting how she's feeling in that moment. I think that's just such wonderful and practical advice for people to take away. That's right. And you are enough. Stop apologizing for something that's outside of your control. And if you're here watching and you've battled migraine for a while, you know this disease can strike out of the blue and quickly take over. And there are many physical, emotional, mental, and social impacts of chronic pain and disability that migraine can cause. And by sharing the stories of brave, brave advocates like Nikki, we hope that you can uncover something that helps you turn the corner and make more informed decisions for your own health and well-being. Thanks for joining us for Me Versus Migraine. If you have a story that might help others, we would love to hear it. Just send us uh, your message through our website at worldhealtheducation.org. You can also subscribe to all of our Me Versus Migraine episodes at worldhealtheducation.org. And this episode was produced by the World Health Education Foundation in association with Migraine World Summit. Thanks to our producer, Lydia Evans, and of course, to Nikki for joining us today. And thank you, Carl, for joining me on Me Versus Migraine. I'm Paula Dumas, wishing you strength in your battle with migraine.